Good evening, Dr. Dean. How are you? Hi, welcome. We'll get started. You know, as people come on in and our guests of the evening show up, but they'll be coming in shortly, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, I'm a little early. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon, Dr. Dean. Uh, Deputy Mayor is just having a few technical difficulties getting registered for the meeting, but he is sitting directly across from me. So just give us a few moments and then he'll be joining. Hey, Dr. Dean. Hello, hello, welcome to the first of the Ward um, 7 
school year that people are coming in. Hold on one second. Um, so let me start off with just saying welcome, welcome, welcome. I um, want to remind everyone that our, um, our meetings are recorded and they can be all found on our YouTube channel. We also send them out through um, our listservs and we post our meetings on a number of different um, social media. Um, and I'm getting messages from people. Hold on. People are like, I don't have the link, even though it's posted everywhere. Hold on one second, you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Give me one second. Michelle, you're coming in 12 times. No, <laughs> I know people are sharing the same registration link. That's all it is. But anyway, welcome everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we're really excited to begin the year with the Deputy Mayor um, Paul Kai. There is so much happening in his office that this is a perfect um, place to begin to really um, think about um, the landscape. So we wanna welcome um, everyone Schools in session. Um, kids are back in class. Everything is in motion. And so we want to celebrate um, students, families, parents, and teachers and administrators because they're back in full swing. So excited about all of that. Um, the agenda for today's meeting is a welcome by me. Um, and then I'll quickly turn it over to the deputy mayor um, and his team to talk about so many different things that are going on, school boundary and student assignment, master facility plan, high school redesign and dual enrollment and the adequate, adequacy study. So as I said, so many important um, um, discussions, initiatives, planning and, um, is coming out of his office. So it's really important that the community is well informed also, we will hear from our State Board of Education rep to give updates coming out of the State Board um, of Education. She is also the president of the State Board. And then we will close out with some announcements. So with that, I um, want to introduce Deputy Mayor Paul Kai. He's no um, stranger to the Ward 7 Ed Council. Um, I think every year since you've been in this role, you've come to us and spoken to us and given us an understanding of what's happening um, in your office and given an opportunity for feedback. So I um, think that's where we want to go. Um, are you and your team ready? Do I need to give sharing? Purpose? What do I need to do? Anything like that? Uh, yes, if you could give sharing privileges to one of the Michelle Yans, it's going to be a fun game to guess should which one. Be, First should, one it one should it be you or someone else? To me, to me, yeah. Okay. I, I, I made you a co-host and now you can do whatever you want to do, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, Dr. Dean. And while we're, we're pulling up, we have a, a short presentation, but I wanted to also, um, first of all, uh, express my heartfelt <laughs> gratitude to you for your leadership. We love coming to the Ward 7 Education Council. You have been very generous with your own time and participating in lots of what we'll talk about tonight. Uh, so thank you for that. And the spoiler alert here is we'll touch on a lot of a lot of really important undertakings in the city, but this is an invitation for further participation. So we've got lots of information here about upcoming meetings and town halls. We're including all of our contact information. So um, we want to be very good stewards uh, and partners in all of this work. 
Let me just begin by inviting my uh, team members uh, uh, to introduce themselves briefly and share what they're um, hoping to um, contribute this evening and what they're working on. I am Paul Kine, the Deputy Mayor for, uh, for Education. I'm helping to oversee this work. Uh, and I have with me colleagues from my office who are each helping with different work streams. So uh, let's start, Michelle uh, Yan, with you. Hi, folks. My name is Michelle Yan. I am Chief of Staff here in the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Education. Um, for one portion of what we're going to be talking about today, I am leading our adequacy study which is looking at school funding across the district and the best ways for us to resource our schools in support of children. Uh, so look forward to engaging with folks on that. Uh, but cover many, many other areas within uh, DME and the public education cluster. So you can always feel free to come to me with any questions, concerns, uh, feedback. Thanks, Michelle. Jen? Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jen Comey. I'm the Director of Planning Analysis at the DME. Uh, I see many familiar names uh to here tonight so it's nice to see you and i'll be talking about the boundary and student assignment study and the master facilities plan so jen is leading both of those work streams on behalf of the office clara hey everyone nice to see you all uh, i'm clara botstein i'm office uh, also in the office of the dme uh, legislative director and uh, for tonight's purposes i'm here to talk a little bit about secondary pathways including dual enrollment and the advanced technical center and Claire will be familiar to many of you for having led the establishment of Bard Early College uh, when it was in Ward 7. Thanks, Clara. Deandra. Good evening, everyone. Deandra Brooks. I am the community ambassador for the DME, and I'm rooted in the community, working with our residents and our young people and ensuring that their voices are represented in our conversations. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Deandra. Yes, we never see Deandra in the office, which I think is a good thing. So thank you. Thank you, Deandra. So let me, uh, let me. Um... Can I just say one thing before you get started? Of course. Um, first of all, Jennifer, I'm really excited. Her daughter is off to University of Michigan. Go blue. Just had to say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then um, the other piece is we have no less than four back to school nights going on in Ward 7 tonight. So there is a lot going on education-wise. Um, and so I just want to make people aware of the fact that there's just a lot going on. So we appreciate everyone who could be here because a lot of back-to-school nights are happening as we speak. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Dr. Dean. Really appreciate that. Uh, so we've got, uh, we have a short presentation this evening, uh, which consists, I think, of something like six or seven pages. It's my thought that we'll just go through what we're working on and then we'll pull the slides down so that we can, as usual, have a nice conversation with you all, either points of feedback or questions that you've got. Uh, and of course, we're including all of our information here so we can follow up. So let's start in the same place, Dr. Dean, that you started, which is uh, just a profound, um, uh, uh, I don't know, set of joys and gratitudes for a really strong start to this 23-24 school year. Um, we know we got the park results back, which showed progress in both reading and math, uh, almost three points in both uh, places. And while it's clear we have so much work to continue to do together as we strive for the kinds of improvements we really need to see, uh, it's wonderful to see us back on the same trajectory of growth and improvement that we were on before the pandemic. And in particular, over at DCPS, our overall reading proficiency is almost back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and of course, a number of our LEAs have performed extremely well. I see John here from Friendship, which uh, which really did extremely well. The students at Friendship did really well uh, in showing progress. And in fact, uh, we've got a number of what we call comeback schools uh, right here in Ward 7. And these are schools uh, that basically now have higher ELA proficiency than they had before the pandemic. That includes Thomas, Sousa, Houston, C.W. Harris, Beers, uh, and of course, Blow Pierce. Um, and uh, these are schools we should all be extremely proud of because uh, of the work that they're doing. Uh, you know, the president visited Award 7 school, Elliot Hine. We've got a photograph of that there. Uh, also importantly, this school year, We've launched year two of our advanced technical center, which we'll talk a little bit more about. It's now in its permanent home at Penn Center, which is in Eckington. 
And this is the really wonderful state-of-the-art facility where high school students from any high school in the city, any public high school in the city can go and study cybersecurity or uh, nursing. We had more than 40% of students last year at the ATC from Ward 7 and 8, uh, and Eastern Friendship Collegiate and IDEA, all from Ward 7, were founding high schools in the ATC. And this year, we're doubling the enrollment, uh, and we've got more than a dozen high schools participating. So we're really excited about that. Uh, and of course, we've got a lot of work going on to continue to strengthen where we see gaps. Uh, one example uh, is that DCPS has now rolled out its new math curriculum called Building Blocks uh, to pre-K students. And we had a great chance to visit a school to see that in action. It's really exciting. And uh, and Aussie is rolling out math boot camps for educators to help with math training uh, that are paid uh, stipended opportunities for teachers across uh, all public schools. So we're really excited about this year, and we know we have lots and lots of work to do together. We are committed in my office uh, and in the executive uh, in an ongoing way to a set of core priorities. We've got five priorities which have been consistent in the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. They are listed here on the page. They include academic acceleration uh, for all students and making sure everyone's ready for college and career, including closing gaps that we see across the system. We're focused on positive youth development and engagement. That makes sure we got great programming for students. Kids are showing up every day at school, uh, continue to develop uh, on their own journeys. We remain committed, number three, to youth well-being and safety. Safety is top of mind for all of us, and we continue to make investments there and work with schools and school communities on ensuring that we've got great plans in place for our students to make sure they remain safe. Fourth, we're focused on citywide planning and coordination. We saw lots of new and innovative ways of working together in the pandemic. We're sustaining a lot of that uh, as we work on many of the projects we'll touch on tonight. And lastly, in my cluster, we also have workforce development as we follow this cradle into career continuum. So we remain focused on an inclusive jobs recovery, removing barriers and making sure we've got high quality workforce training uh, for families across the system. Now, these are our five priority areas. They've been consistent. Tonight, we'll talk about four specific projects that we're doing, which are the ones we thought, and I think Dr. Dean, you thought would be of most interest. But I wanna share with you that they all work in an integrated way to help us accomplish these specific goals. So I'll move through each of these four specific projects we wanted to talk with you about. We'll touch on what we're doing in each one, what are some of the interesting things we're learning from them, and then we'll, as I said, take down the slides and we can talk about any of these that you're most interested in. So we'll start with what we call reimagining high school. And this is us collectively as a city understanding that we have much to be proud of. Our graduation rates have been going up about two points per year for the last decade. That's literally hundreds and thousands of more students are graduating from our schools. At the same time, we also know that less than 10% of every ninth grade class ends up with a four-year bachelor's degree in college. And so we've got to do more and we've got to be different. And we can no longer expect every single individual high school to do the work all on their own. And so as a city, we're leaning into creating meaningful post-secondary preparation opportunities for all high school students, in particular by focusing on shared learning opportunities. There are opportunities available to all students. These include, for example, the Advanced Technical Center, which I mentioned earlier, other kinds of shared CTE programming available to students, regardless of the school you attend. We're expanding our dual enrollment work and Clara has been leading a fabulous working group that's come up with a set of strong recommendations about how to get to many, many more students. Currently, we estimate about 8% of our high school students have access to dual enrollment. We'd like to double and triple that number. We're expanding our work-based learning for students where students can be in internships that not only pay them, but also provide high school credit. So it's not just you're going off to a job site for the sake of the learning you're doing there, which is critical, but you're also getting to do that in a way that rewards you um, with a stipend and also with a credit. 
And finally, I'll mention in this reimagined high school domain, we've launched this year our virtual course hub. And this for me is one of the main things we've learned coming out of the pandemic. That is students are in the right circumstances able to learn virtually. And also not every high school can offer every single course that a student would benefit from. So our virtual, horse our vir our virtual course hub is a chance to provide high quality rare courses that schools themselves cannot provide taught synchronously by good teachers and brought into every high school in the city. So this fall, we've launched this with five high schools. Students in those schools are taking AP Physics. They're taking ASL. They're taking Animation CTE. And they go to a room, it's scheduled. They've got a learning coach in the room that helps with technology and can help with small group work as the teachers request. And then they take the course virtually uh, with a teacher who is who is remote. That's a pilot this year that we're doing in, in the spirit of reimagining our high school to provide more and more access. So we've got the ATC site up and running this year. We've got the virtual course hub launching. We've got the dual enrollment report and recommendations coming out. And we're very excited about this work. Clara, as I mentioned, uh, is leading uh, much of this work. Her contact information is here on the side. It'll be here again uh, towards the end. There's going to be focus groups coming up uh, to get student and family input on these things. So please stay tuned for all that. Now, moving on to our boundary study. Uh, and here again, we pause for gratitude to Dr. Dean uh, for participation on the advisory committee. Uh, but this is a very, very important study for us as a city, because here is where we're trying to get to a set of strong recommendations based on our analysis and all our community feedback that we're doing about strengthening access to public schools for students and families. There are three specific goals which we've detailed here for this study. The first, and in some ways the most, um, most powerful, uh, and the most public facing is we're developing clear rights for boundaries and feeder schools. So this is where if we've got to make some adjustments in the actual attendance zones for DCPS by right schools, um, we will make those recommendations. This is where if we think uh, collectively we need to adjust some ways in which feeder patterns flow, we'll do that through this study. But in addition to that, we're also making sure that through our policies we're creating adequate capacity for current and future enrollments. And what I mean by that is, this is where we can make recommendations on the number and percent of out of boundary students uh, that any um, neighborhood school can take in. This is where we'll talk about the idea of any additional preferencing that we might want to include in the school lottery. But all of these things are in service of the final goal listed here, which is ensuring we've got equitable access to good schools. And here, um, we're learning a lot. One of the things we've learned about is just the distance that some families have to travel and the inequitable distances that we see across the city. So for example, Ward 7 students travel almost a mile further to get to school compared to the citywide median distance. And we're looking at a set of potential recommendations that can help alleviate some of that inequity. We also, by the way, are beginning to look at our public school enrollment projections going forward. And we don't have the exact numbers yet, we'll share them when we do, but we do know, and it's very dramatic, that births in Washington DC have been declining since 2016. And if you look at the graph, it is a downward slope from 2016. And if our, if our births are declining, we know we can predict that kindergarten enrollment will decline five years on from each of those moments. And so we may be facing something we haven't seen in a while, which is either slowed or no growth in our overall public school population, which will create um, all kinds of new pressures. So again, this is the study where we'll take those things into account. We've got a great advisory committee made up of folks from all over the city, as I said, including Dr. Dean. We've got our next meeting coming up next week on the 14th, which is Thursday. They're open to um, the public to watch. We've got the live stream link here. We've got recordings of all the prior ones, and we've got two more town halls coming up uh, that'll be virtual on the 26th and 27th of this month. You can register and attend, um, make your thoughts uh, and opinions known through those channels. 
We also have ongoing feedback forms uh, that are open uh, and live at any point. And Jen Comey, who's on, who's leading this work, um, is available uh, to meet and talk with um, talk with any kind of group that wants to. Jen, what would you add uh, based on what I've said about the boundary study? Uh, that it um, the two things. So one another shout out to Nzinga Toll, who is also uh, participating tonight, who's another advisory committee member. This is not a uh, small ask to have. Dr. Dean and Nzinga participate, so we really appreciate as well the other advisory committee members. I think the other thing is it's exciting to actually cover the breadth of different DME initiatives because I think as the advisory committee members are aware, anyone who's following, we have been referencing sort of the reimagining CTE work. And so it's nice to get some more specifics and have some more conversation around that uh, explicitly because while the boundary study won't be tackling that directly, it's great where it can link, right? And it can leverage other efforts to also help improve uh, educational opportunities for kids. Thanks, Jen. All right, well, we'll transition then to the next project that we're undertaking, which is also under Jen's leadership, which is our master facilities plan. And uh, anyone who's been anywhere near the public school system in Washington, DC, uh, anytime over the last few years knows that we out of the DME actually regularly produce master facilities plans. This one is special in a couple of ways. Firstly, uh, we're re-upping the 10-year plan now, which is the roadmap to look at our public school facility needs. But also one of our goals is to ensure that every student's daily experience is in a well-maintained facility. So the way to think about the Emma, the way to think about the boundary study is that it's looking at our policy environment around access to good schools in DC. The master facilities plan is looking at our physical infrastructure and our physical footprint of our buildings. And we wanna make sure our facilities are well utilized, that every student is enrolled in a modern state-of-the-art facility, and that every student's experience is in a well-maintained facility. So we are looking at the PACE Act and how we do those calculations. Um, if you follow that, you'll know uh, that this is the act that helps determine the order of modernizations we saw some big changes uh, in the most recent list. Plumber uh, actually dropped from number 24 to number 34, which is a big concern to many residents in Ward 7 and certainly to our office. And we think this is due in part to the enrollment decrease that they've seen. And we are, through this study, beginning to think about whether these are the right factors and weights for the PACE Act. So this is a great place for uh, community members and families to weigh in to let us know if we think the way we're calculating the PACE Act actually is uh, is not exactly right. Uh, and that's just one example of it. So here we have some very exciting new analysis and work that we've undertaken as well. We are revamped our DCPS and charter programmatic capacities. So that's how we do the denominator of all our utilization numbers. So when we talk about a school that's either overutilized or underutilized, that's based on what we believe is the number of students that can fit programmatically in the buildings. We've done a lot of work with our consultants to revamp those numbers. And so we'll have those to share uh, in the coming weeks. We're also gonna have, as I mentioned earlier, new five and 10 year school enrollment projections for the system and also uh, at the more local level to help guide some of our planning work. And then again, we'll consider the modernization needs as I shared across the, across the system. The MFP, like the boundary study, lots of chance for engagement. We actually have two more uh, public town halls coming up in October, October 4th and 5th. You can register and attend and learn what we're learning uh, and provide your perspective and input. We've got also online forms. And again, we're also happy to come to groups uh, or engage with folks uh, on topics related to MFP um, as you want. Um, with Deandra uh, or with Jen. So uh, here again, please feel free to reach out as we continue down this path. I think our last project that we'll talk about tonight uh, is certainly not least, uh, and in some ways um, carries some of the more um, um, additionally profound implications, and that's our adequacy study. And here, the adequacy study, if the boundary study is looking at policy and the MFP is looking at our physical footprint, the adequacy study is really our exploration of school funding. How much money do we need to put into this system in order to ensure that we are providing a really good education for every single student uh, that we have? So here, 
we're looking at how we're using uh, dollars today in our schools with an effort to try to understand what's actually working. And then we're asking the simple questions with complex answers about how we should allocate our UPSFF dollars and whether the multipliers in the formula are right uh, to accelerate learning. And also in this study, we have decided to ask how we should allocate our non-UPSFF dollars to maintain the strong instruction uh, and ecosystem of supports that we need. So for example, today, DC Health gets funding separately to provide school nurses and DBH gets funding separately to provide mental health clinicians. And there are other examples of that. So we want to be very explicit about what we think the UPSFF needs to pay for and making sure we've designed it as a city in a way that will cover the costs that are required. And also acknowledging that there are other local dollars that go to support our students uh, in important ways. So this, uh, this study uh, is ongoing now. We are going to be having family focus groups, panels of educators uh, and school staff called professional judgment panels. We're having structured interviews with school leaders to talk about what they um, believe are the right trade-offs and budgeting decisions to be made. So um, we've got lots of engagement going on around the adequacy study as well. So here we've got family focus groups on September the 14th and on September 18th, uh, which, uh, which you and other um, families in Ward 7 should absolutely register for if you have an inclination to help support us building our insights. But here again, let me pause Michelle and ask what you would add uh, to what I've already shared. Yeah, I think an important element of this work is that we don't wanna consider the funding formula in a silo and in a vacuum, recognizing that as schools think about their resourcing decisions, it's driven by who are the students coming into their building? What, is, what are all of the needs of the students entering in? And what are the best ways for us as a district to best support our children and really centering our children in this work? And we want to make sure we're bolstering and creating um, the right resources so that schools can do what they do best, educating students in exceptional ways. And to this third point around how we're thinking about non-UPSFF dollars, we are also thinking about what it means for our district to better support our students so that schools can focus on what they do best and can focus in on the instructional core. Um, and some of the research that we're looking at and some of the data that we've already started to analyze has shown the ways that schools are increasing their resources, but specifically on wraparound supports, on student supports, on mental health resources. And so as we think about what the best way is for us to efficiently use our resources, we also, also are considering the role of the community, the role of the neighborhood, the role of our social services uh, more broadly as a district so that our students can be set up for the best success. This study will, I think, be revelatory as well as containing some really interesting recommendations that we'll develop together in ways that Michelle was describing. So for example, we've looked already at the staffing of schools. We're trying to understand what are the adults doing in our school buildings and how are schools making decisions about how to allocate resources. And we've seen that in elementary schools that have high at-risk populations, they have the same student to teacher ratio as schools with low at-risk populations, but they have many more support staff. And that's the kind of thing that we want to look at and investigate uh, to understand how we're spending our money and then to look together to see whether we have other ideas about ways that we can be successful. So let me now move forward and share uh, again our contact information. That's for me, Michelle, Jen, Clara, uh, we have neglected to include Deandra on this list uh, um, only because she's not leading one of the bodies of work we've shared. But Deandra, if you can just put your information in the chat if you haven't already, um, so folks know how to find you. Um, obviously, we have a presence online. Uh, we produce lots of insight, including our ed sites, which we hope are interesting and will help inform our policy discussion. Uh, and before I pause completely, let me just come, Clara, to you, uh, since I haven't yet to see if there's anything I've omitted from our overall discussion here that you want to share before we turn to a Q&A &A and, and discussion with the group. No, I think that's... Oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry, Clara, Marlon. You, said, you go Clara, ahead. I thought you said... Oh, yes. I was going to say we didn't hear from Clara. It's more about her work, but I thought you had done a good coverage. So let me... 
make sure Clara gets on camera. That's it. Yeah. No, I agree, Marla. I think uh, Deputy Mayor did a good job. Um, I, the only thing I'd say is um, you are interested in learning more about the Virtual Course Hub. We currently have um, five LEAs or five schools um, for LEAs participating. So we'd love to have more, including from Ward 7. So I'm happy to chat more about that offline or on today's call. And then similarly, um, if you're involved in the school and you're curious about the Advanced Technical Center, um, we're really excited about the representation of Ward 7 students and would love to keep that up as we grow these programs. So um, happy to, to chat more about that. And just a huge thanks to a, a few of you, including Marla, who's weighed in on the dual enrollment report, which should be coming out um, in the next month or so. So thank you. All right, Marla, uh, Dr. Dean, we'll turn it over to you then to facilitate a discussion. You can call me Marla, I'm good, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> so um, I think, um, first of all, I appreciate um, Jen saying that Nzinga is um, on the Boundary um, Study Committee and I'm very much excited about um, what she offers. She's incredibly insightful and eloquent at the same time. Um, also, I just want you to know that next week, September 14th, I'll be with you guys, and it's my birthday. And so, <laughs> so I convinced my husband we'll leave to go out of town the next day and not on my birthday, so I can be there for the boundary committee. I really want to talk about um just some as people start to um put questions in the chat. Um, I want to just to talk about some of the things you highlighted. You talked about um, Ward 7 students having to travel um, on average about one mile um, more in distance than um, many of their peers. That doesn't sound like a lot when you think about it, but in a city that is approximately 10 square miles, it's not a huge city, and a city that is um, incredibly difficult to navigate um, from a time standpoint of getting one point from point A to point B. Um, what, why is this an issue? Why do we care about this? What was the impact of travel time on children and families? And why is that part of your consideration um, in thinking about boundaries and the other issues that you outlined today? Uh, Marla, thanks. Thanks for that, Jen. I'm going to ask you to weigh in on what we're hearing. I mean, I'll just, I mean, I'll just, I'll just share that I care about that mostly because I am, I am told often by families that, um, that it's something that they don't think is fair. But Jen, why don't you, why don't you share a little bit more descriptively why we're focusing on travel time and distance? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different things. So. As um, obviously the advisory committee members are aware and those that have been following along, we've been talking about priority challenges now for guiding principles and priority challenges. And that has been highlighted from the beginning that families in Ward 7 are traveling further, that they are leaving the ward more than other parts of the city in order to um, find other places to go to school. And so they're not, um, they're not staying as close to home as other families have chosen so far. That's not saying that it's not all, but they are, there are more of them and they're going far. Um, and so we want to make sure that families, particularly at the elementary school level, have options close to home that they feel good about choosing. Uh, so I think that's, Dr. Dean, one of the reasons that has been a priority and has been lifted up by the advisory committee members and other folks uh, that we've been talking to. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I think it's not just the distance travel, it's the leaving of community and the western westward movement, northwest movement, um, that concerns War 7 Ed Council because we just don't want our families, our community to believe that their children can't get the type of education that they're entitled to deserve in their own community. And so that's why we continue to raise that um, issue. You also talked about um, projections that um, in five years, we'll probably see some um, significant declines in who's enrolling in kindergarten. Um, what, what can we expect with that? What should we consider? And are those population declines 
actually happening in Ward 7? Yeah, so we'll come to some specifics there in a second. I, I would simply share, these things are, we're gonna do our best to use census data, Office of Planning data, uh, and others to come up with a decent set of five and 10 year school age population projections. This of course is influenced not just by the number of births we see, but also whether people stay living um, where they are, and also whether you get an in-migration of folks who actually move to the district overall. And that's something we have seen um, over time that DC has really benefited from that. The mayor has established a goal in recovery of growing the overall population, both by causing residents who want to stay to be able to stay and remain, and also by actually attracting new families to come and live in the district. If it turns out that these birth these declines in births actually do translate into either slowed or no growth in the school level populations. And we see additional space in schools continue to come online. We then have this tension, which is exacerbated between the number of students we have and the number of space we have, the amount of space we have in our schools. And so we want to be very careful and proactive in how we think about that uh, and address it. But Jen, do you want to talk more specifically about what we're what we're seeing in regards to that? Um, yeah, I think the I think the there's more work to do. We're not ready to have final ones, and we're going to sit down with them as soon as both the advisory committee and publicly once we're ready that the, all the all the tweaks have been made. But I do think there has been sort of a there's been a it looks it appears at this point that there appears to be a bit of a change in our trajectory in the district in the sense of we were having very large growth population overall in the last decade and we're still office of planning is still projecting growth but much more tempered and so i think between that um births going down since 2016 uh and our covid during the some of our covid years we you know we didn't have as high enrollment in our early childhood grades that this can have ripple effects that i think we should be considering and looking at. So Dr. Dean will be able to look and see, we're doing at the school level, so we'll be able to see which schools are being impacted in particular. Um, but I mean, the good news too, is that our middle and high school enrollments have been growing. And so we expect those to also continue going forward. So we had this sort of interesting, it looks like, it feels like at this point, there's a, it's gonna be a slightly different decade than it's been uh, the last one. And following up on that, because I was going to ask you, how do you interface and interact with the Office of Planning? To Do you consider where development is happening, where density can happen, um, and thinking about these things? So just wondering about that kind of interaction between um, different offices. Yeah, so we get we talk regularly with Office of Planning, um, and they, in their total forecast, they certainly take um, in um, response to both population and where they reallocate um, individuals based on uh, the housing um, development pipeline, it's called, which is the big projects, the residential projects that they see coming online in the near future. It goes out quite far, but they wanna take you know, the, the next 10 years, the ones that feel quite, quite real and are gonna happen. Um, and so we work with them. They certainly take that into account. And then part of our technical team for the boundary and MFP study has also been highlighting and drilling down into those specific developments and trying to estimate impact of what it could be on public school. Now we know in a lot of places, kids go to school all over, right? It's not just Ward 7, it's other parts of the city that, that happens as well. But we are gonna be highlighting those areas. So we'll be able to put that up against what we see is more school-based enrollment projections and then see if we have any other pain points. So we'll be comparing them and it's it's very important. Residential development is a, is a factor. Um, okay. Um, Deputy Mayor Clinton, you talked about plumber as an example, but you went through that quickly and if, I didn't know anything about um, the PACE Act. I wouldn't have understood exactly what you were saying. So can you just talk to that again? Um, so I asked some questions knowing the answers, but believing that people, others may not. I would not have totally understood what you were talking about. So can you talk about what is the PACE Act and why? What, can you talk about that whole process a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. and Mark, I apologize for that. You're right. It wasn't fair. I mean, the PACE Act is a formula-driven approach to trying to rank order our public schools 
from those that will have the greatest need for modernization to those that have the least need for modernization. And there are a number of variables that go into the formula that we calculate. Those variables include um, enrollment in the school. Uh, those variables include whether or not you received uh, phase one modernization. Those variables include um, the age of the building uh, and so on. In the case of Plummer, we were struck because they, when we recalculated the PACE Act, the, the list of, of PACE schools as we do um, regularly, it dropped from uh, number 24 to number 34 on the list because one of the variables got lower and that was their enrollment. And so the point I was making is, it's an important time for us to make sure that we still believe that formula is the right formula, that we're including the right set of variables as we consider which schools should be ranked high on our modernization list versus lower down. Jen knows this very expertly, and I'm almost embarrassed to be offering this explanation in front of her, but uh, you look, Jen, like you're at least partially nodding. So I assume I'm I'm close, okay. Excellent. Um, and so, um, Clara, I know that you have been doing um, a lot of work around um, dual enrollment. And when you talked about um, AT, um, the ATC Center, can you talk about the full, a little bit about the scope of what dual enrollment possibilities are? Just a little bit. I'm not, I don't want you to preview your report, <laughs> but what is it? What does it mean? What are some of the options? How is it operationalized in different communities? What does it mean for students? Why do we care? Why should we care? Yeah, thanks, Marla. Um, could talk about dual room all day. Um, so I think I'll start with why should we care? Um, it's one of the evidence-based approaches for improving college readiness. And for those of you, I know all of you are deep in education, um, we really have a college readiness challenge in DC, like many places across the country, vast majority of students who go to college don't finish. And so dual enrollment is one way to actually say, okay, students will let you take a college course for free, ideally with support. Um, and that way you can actually become a college student by trying college. Um, and ideally that's part of a pathway and you're earning credits towards the degree you ultimately pursue. But regardless, you could just get fired up about a course that you hadn't taken before, like introduction to psychology or whatever it is. Um, because we know that high school courses are, you know, by nature relatively limited and college courses, the menu can be quite broad. Um, so right now in DC, um, dual enrollment, there are a couple of ways that students can access it. Um, for those of you with DCPS, um, the district has done a great job of setting up partnerships. So there are early college high schools where students can actually be working towards an associate's degree while they're in high school. Um, we've got three of those in the district right now. Um, you can, there are additional partnerships that DCPS has set up with colleges so that students can access courses um, and happy to talk through some of the models there. And then Aussie, our state agency also has um, programs really recognizing the fact that DC is unique. We have a ton of independent colleges in town. I think it's probably one of the highest concentrations of colleges in the country uh, per capita. Um, and we have one public in institution, which is UDC. And so it's hard for schools to set up partnerships with these big institutions. And so Aussies set up those partnerships for them um, via what's called the dual enrollment consortium. So that means that any student in the city can apply um, through Aussie and actually uh, pretty much every student is age eligible after 10th grade, uh, starting 10th grade, and they can take courses, whether it's at UDC or Trinity or GW um, for free. And so the Aussie sort of centralizes that process. Um, and that's a program that serves about 400 students. It's been growing um, and received some federal funding uh, to support that growth. So that's a great resource. I think it's probably one that many students don't know about. So we love your brain power and help spreading the word because again, every student is eligible. There's actually no GPA cutoff um, for at least for some of the college partnerships. Um, and then uh, the Advanced Technical Center is something we're really excited about. Again, similar to an early college, this is a pathway model. So students can take courses transferable to degrees in both cybersecurity and general nursing right now. And we're looking at additional pathways that students might be interested in. Um, so if anyone's interested in coming to visit, we just launched a beautiful new building um, where courses are being taught, really great state-of-the-art facility, um, both from UDC and from Trinity Washington, totally free of charge. 
um, essentially helping students get a head start on their careers, on their college studies. Um, and so this is the kind of program that we're seeking to build out. So helping schools offer these programs in-house, so to speak, but also making sure that um, districts and LEAs can take advantage of all the different higher ed resources in town um, and make sure that those, those opportunities are accessible and free for students. Um, I think we've got a lot of great things happening um, and a lot of room to grow in this work. So happy to chat more, Marla, but I think um, part of it is helping spread the word, frankly, um, that these programs exist for students and families. And um, just as a also a note about um, high school redesign, H.D. Wilson is actually in a redesign process through um, XQ. So there's a lot going on. So I just want to make sure that people are aware of um, the work that is happening at H.D. Um, in addition to that, um, Deputy Mayor Klein, I want to come back to you for a second. You started to talk about um, staffing and I think if I heard you correctly, you said that instructional um, teacher to student ratios are pretty consistent across the district. I think you were saying that um, um, schools with high risk at risk populations have more support staff. When you unpack that, are we talking about behavioral staff, mental health staff? Um, are we talking about um, instructional aides? Who are we talking about in that um, support staff? And do you think that with the current way the staffing is bearing out, that it is um, meeting needs of equity and need? And are we overemphasizing behavior and not putting enough on instructional support? I'm just wondering what you're thinking about around um, the way the staffing patterns are showing at this point. Yeah, Mar Marley, you are, you're probably also, you're probably way ahead of me and us uh, on, our, on our thinking, but, and I am so excited that, that, you know, my simple statement provoked that line of questioning because that's exactly what we're trying to dig into as we continue down the path of this adequacy study because we want to understand, you know, how schools are taking advantage of the money they're getting. The biggest cost in any school is the salary cost of the people, the teachers and the support staff and the, the other educators in the building. And we shared this one detail that we were very struck by where you've got student to teacher ratios. That's different from class size, but student to teacher ratios in elementary schools for both high at risk schools and low at risk schools that are about eight to nine students per teacher. But then when you look at the support staff, the wraparound staff, and Michelle will share a little bit more about that in a second, but there you've got 38 students per adult in the high at risk schools and 52 students per adult in the low at-risk schools. So you've got, you've got many more of the support staff and wraparound staff in the low at-risk schools than you do in the high at-risk schools. Michelle, do you wanna share a little bit more about what we've learned there? Uh, yes, so the, the wraparound supports, sorry, we have a vacuum operating here, so I'm gonna shout. Um, the wraparound supports, we are looking at, for example, guidance counselors, behavioral technicians, um, librarians, folks who are non-instructional support, so not our paraprofessionals or our aides. Um, the two data points that I think stood out to, to us and Dr. Bean standing out to you are the instructional teachers looking very consistent and then the wraparound supports, the, the roles that I just named and, and some of the ones that Dr. Bean, you named as well, um, having seen largely the difference in that population of resources. And I think part of part of this, and we named some of the upcoming interviews, right? Like we wanted to to start with an understanding of the landscape of the data, and then take all of that into our conversations with families, with teachers, with school leaders, to to understand some of these things that you are also trying to unpack. Like, is it best for us to put our resources there? What does it mean for us to do that? Are schools not putting it towards teacher teachers because of physical constraints because of constraints in the hours of the day or because they feel like they need to put it more towards wraparound supports and what does it mean for every single one of our schools to be doing that is that the best way for us as a district to think about this 
or do we need to invest more in mental health services in the community? Are we putting all of this on our schools to solve when we know that our schools are not the only ones in our overall efforts to help build success for our students? Okay, so I'm going to take a few questions from the chat and then I'm going to open it up. We have a people, few people waiting in the queue who are um, asking questions, want to ask questions. And Marla, sorry to, um, I don't want to interrupt, but I do want to share, Clara actually only is with us for another five minutes or so. She actually had another um, commitment tonight. So if you've oh. got questions related to secondary, let's take those first, if that's okay. Okay, so let me quickly look um, so Sarah can go um, quickly. Oh my gosh, I'm feeling pressure. Um, Someone said, I didn't catch the name. Oh, um, Davini, as I said, I did not catch the name, but the, a program where students will be able to attend classes throughout the city are language classes being considered. Mm -hmm. um, since opportunities continue, language immersion options are limited in the city. This is a big issue in work seven about continuity of programming. Okay, go ahead. I think that's for you, Claire. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, and I'd have to yeah. follow up. I think that for, I mean, we've heard a lot of calls for more language options. So separate from the dual language programs, um, I think that's the type of program that could be a great offering both for dual enrollment, but also for our virtual course hub. Um, so it's definitely something we're exploring as we think about what to scale up. Um, I'm happy to chat more. Um, and I know that through the boundary study, the feeder patterns around dual language schools are also being considered. Um, so we'll also share that we've got Clara as one of our inaugural classes through the virtual course hub ASL. Yes. So we are, we are offering a language virtually in these synchronous courses for those that want it. And uh, we're very excited about that. And absolutely we have, and we'd love to hear more about kinds of languages, modes of offering that that, that folks would like to, to understand, but absolutely. In the boundary study, we're looking at dual in dual language programming. The virtual course hub, we're looking at expanding our language course offerings, but we know we have to do much more as a city. And one of the things that's super helpful to get your feedback on is sort of, you know, given that transit is a reality and we don't have common scheduling across the district currently, like when, if you're a parent, like when your students might actually want to do this, we want to make sure these things aren't extras, um, but there are Saturday classes. There are a lot of summer classes. Some students love that. Some students hate it. So one of the things we're figuring out is just kind of where to fit these things and what makes sense to be hybrid or virtual versus in person. So um, certainly welcome feedback on that. And then there's just commentary in the chat around navigating the dual enrollment system and how can we simplify and make it a more accessible um, um, for parents, um, not to put Amy, Amy uh, Whedon on the spot, but she's, you know, pretty in the know. So if she's saying it's difficult, I can only imagine um, how other parents might be navigating that space. So that's just um, um, some feedback there. Um, I want to get to, because I know we are two minutes for you. Alicia, you want to come off chat, um, I mean, off mute and ask your question? Yes, great. Thank you. Although my question is not for um, Deputy Mayor Claire. So if, if there's someone else who wants to grab her last two minutes, I'm happy to yield. Okay. She will be um, interested in the promotion you just gave her, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, let's go to Carla good. real quick and see what her question is. And then if her, um, Carla's is not about um, what for Claire to, then we'll come back to you right away. Um, um, I, about think, you? I think it is. Um, it, it is about high schools and it's, it goes with the uh, dual enrollment question. Um, like I was really pleased to see in the mayor's back to school guide that it listed out the various pathways in the uh, DC public high schools. And I was interested in knowing about similar pathways and um, or specialized programs in charter schools. And then um, combining that with all the stuff that you've had today, it really made me think that there are opportunities for parents and students to really design the experience of their high school students using all of these tools. And I wanted to know if you're working on a guide and I, my phone died while um, the, the session was going, so I may have missed it, but it would be really great if there was a guide 
listing all these programs, the CTE programs, all these things so that as students are choosing high schools, they they can look at these things because I really do think the opportunity to see programs that exist in one school and not another and really being able to design the experience will encourage students to choose schools they might not have otherwise chosen. Okay. A lot of the time people I want, just, wait a minute, wait, you know, I, want to, I want your question to get answered. <laughs> and so, um, so let Claire respond to that about how, how people will be informed. Is there a guy, does that, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. I think you might be referring to the CT pathways um, listed within DCPS. I just dropped in the chat. Um, OSI actually is a pretty user-friendly website, although we will welcome feedback on it, which shows all of the CT pathways across the district, including at charter schools. Uh, the Advanced Technical Center is an example of a cross-sector pathway, so we're testing that out. Um, but I mean, one of the things we were looking at is like, where are CT programs? Who has access? And is it equally distributed across the city? Um, so, but that website is probably the best bet in terms of showing um, the charter side of things. Um, and we also have an ed site, which I'll drop in the chat, which shows a map of CT programs. Um, but I don't know, Deputy Mayor Michelle, if there's additional resources that you'd recommend. Uh, well, I would say the following. Um, first of all, Carl, I agree with I agree with the need that we've got as we begin to build out these various opportunities to be much clearer and more transparent with all families of high school students or those that are going to be entering high school about what's on offer. And we have places now, including some very good resources like the ones Clara's referencing, I think that are good starting points. We've got to integrate those. One thing we're doing this year, um, coming to um, a citywide venue in December is our ed fests will be broken up into two different events. One will be just for high schools. And the reason uh, that we're excited to do that is that will allow us to promote these cross LEA, cross school opportunities in a more fulsome way. So the high schools will be represented what they're offering, but also the virtual course hub, the ATC, um, the dual enrollment work that we're doing. We're planning on being very, um, very clear about those offerings as well in that, in that forum. And we have to work on uh, other ways that we can clarify and share um, all of this wonderful work that's happening. Um, so I want to say thank you to um, Clara, uh, Clara for coming tonight. I want to let you give you opportunity to exit so that you can get to wherever you're going. Um, someone also said that, uh, oh, Michelle, you put in there that my school, um, DC, also has a CTE filter that you can filter for programs there to find out more. Um, so just um, those are some of the resources that are available. Anything you want to say in closing before you exit and I go back to asking questions? I mean, ask, um, okay, calling so the questions. Good to see you all. Okay, thank you. Um, Alicia, um, we're going to come back to you and your question. And then we'll go back to Carla to finish um, off her question to see if there's any more to it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, please forgive me, Deputy Mayor Kine. My uh, brain is moving faster than my mouth this evening. And really, I was trying to say my question is really directed to you and Jen and Michelle. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking with you all and others on the call um, in the past about my concerns um, regarding the lack of access to highly competitive uh, public schools for Ward 7 families like my own. At last count, we were up to about 25% of the DCPS families, if you include Ward 7 and Ward 8, who are actually traveling outside of the ward um, much further than one mile. We are going potentially 12 to 15 miles out of our neighborhoods to access highly competitive schools. Um, um, and as it relates to your third priority with equitable access to quality schools, I'd really like to hear um, how the lack of these highly competitive schools in um, the Far East neighborhoods are being contemplated and considered as, as part of your work and this study um, so that we can, um, you know, really recapture some of the families that are being lost and um, who are being uh, disserviced by uh, this lack of access. 
Yeah, thanks, Alicia. And it's nice to um, to hear you again. You are such an eloquent uh, and powerful advocate in my mind for um, families um, in Ward Seven. So thank you for being here and sharing that. Um, what what I will share is that we are at the we are at the front end now of our solution development as we've been looking at the various challenges, including um, your clearer articulation of some of the travel challenges and the idea of new school development and or the idea of creating more competitive or selective schools uh, is on the list of potential solutions that will be considered by the advisory committee and all of us through our public input. So, you know, we, we, um, we, we, we understand the position that you're sharing. You have been very eloquent on this topic and we are including this in the list of potential um, solutions to some of the challenges, including the one that you have shared. But we're not, we're not yet in a position where we've got clear recommendations because in our process now, we've been doing our analysis, developing the potential set of ways that we can resolve some of these challenges. And that's, that's clearly one of them. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the compliment, appreciate it. I, I think to broaden us, I think this is why I raised the issue of for all our families, whether they're going to what we would consider competitive schools or not, the movement west and north and west is not a solution. And we don't want a system in Ward 7 that in some ways kind of picks winners and losers, right? And so just trying to figure out how we have, I mean, it's very important to us that we have um, a consistent um, programming. So if you start in a, a, um, in a language immersion school, that you can actually follow that through through your whole um, K-12 experience in your community that you're not forced to travel or whatever the case may be. So we're really trying to push for how those types of experiences will be um, made available for all children in Ward 7. So that, because the reality is all Ward 7 kids can't pick up and go to Ward 3 to go to school. And so when you do that, the few that get to go, we're picking winners and losers. We want everyone to win. We believe all our children can win. And so we're trying to figure out how to have um, support that goal and that outcome. Um, so I think that's a very important um, conversation. Carla, I wanna come back to you um, and make sure we got to your question. And then I want to um, go to Christina Jones. Um, yeah, my question was sort of, well, my question was answered, but I really was making a request and it, it really is for all this information to be located in one place, like a guide. I think the, um, EdFest idea is really good, but it was a lot of information. It's a lot of great stuff and, um, it just doesn't work well when we have to get the information from multiple sources, a lot of times high schools aren't, or even middle schools aren't good at providing the op, um, the um, opportunities. And just even things like, I, I, I remember, I know a parent who applied to the MacArthur School only to find out after her kid got in that the CTE offerings were all science-based when her kid is not a science kid. And so what I'm saying to you is she didn't know when she was looking at high schools about things like that. So it would be great to, you know, maybe there was a Ward 7 school that had a CTE program that her kid would have liked and she might have chosen, but she didn't know. So I'm just asking for that kind of information to be provided and accessible to students and parents so they don't have to rely on schools um, to get that information. Yeah, I want to second the more ways that we can streamline information to um, parents. I mean, I think parents are their children's first and best 
teacher, advocate, all of that. So that's really important. I think schools try and get information, but there's a lot um, of different needs. Parents know what they um, um, want for their children. So I think that's really important. One of the things I consistently hear about um, DC is, you know, we're a relatively resource uh, rich um, district city. If we can figure out a little bit more on coordination and how people get the information, I think that's going to be really helpful. So I think that feedback is really important. Um, can we go to Christina Jones now? Hi, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am a proud parent of a Elsie Whitlow Stokes East End pre-K um, three-er. So this is our first year. I've actually been involved in the Word 7 Ed Council before I had a child. So it's been a, a couple years um, through my work with the Office of the Attorney General um, with our education work there. Um, I just really wanted to re reiterate the fact that um, even though my son is in pre-K three, middle school is far off, but it's right also right around the corner. And I think you know, I am very happy to pile on and lend, lend my voice as an advocate to make sure that we have dual immersion schools in um, Ward 7, at, at least east of the river, because right now DCI, I don't see that being an option because my kid is a walker right now. I'm proud of the fact that we can literally walk to Elsie Whitlow Stokes and that combined with the um, excellent education and all of the really great word of mouth references that I had um, when, when I was choosing a school really made me want to pick Stokes to make sure that we remain in Ward 7 and really a part of our community. So for me, I'm happy to beat the drum as loud as we need to, <laughs> to make sure that our kids, this is, this is, for me, this is an equity issue. There is no reason why we should be traveling to the um, upper reaches of Ward 4, the North, <laughs> as they call it, um, in some places. So I really want to make sure that that is something that um, as an ed council, we really kind of um, fly the banner on um, because it to me it's a, this is a complete equity issue and the fact that DCI is running out of space so there is no you know middle school that's dual immersion where my child is guaranteed a space to continue to be immersed in um, in Spanish which is a language that we choose we chose to immerse him in so I want to make sure that we are capturing that that we don't lose that um, and that's something we really want to um, champion. Thank you. I don't know if there's a response to that. Um, uh, you know, I just, I just first of all, I want to thank you. For, first of all, I'm so happy you're happy with your school choice. Um, is it is it full is it full immersion in pre-K three? It's ninety percent in Spanish, so he's coming home speaking words that I'm I'm really excited about, but I need to get on Duolingo. So <laughs> that's awesome. My 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 four-year-old just started pre-K four in a full immersion program. And I said, well, how's your school day going? And he said, Daddy, they talk Spanish all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the point. <laughs> I was with you. And that's the point. And yes, the idea that we want to help ensure there are progressions through school for him. It's it's the top of the advisory committee list, I think. Uh, Jen, I don't know if you have anything to add more specifically, but that's we're really focused on this as as an equity issue. We looked at the number of dual language programs east of the river. It is not it is not uh, at all where uh, where it needs to be for families. So we uh, we've got this we've got this on our radar and Zynga um, Marla can really help, you know, continue to to promote this as an idea on the advisory committee. Yeah, I just want to say to that point, I think um, the advisory um, committee meetings are available, aren't they? If there's a link, can we put it in there if you can? You can see this has been a consistent conversation that we've raised about um, continuity and program across K-12, about travel time, about a strong system of um, by right schools, just uh, many of the issues that you um, um, talked about and pointed um, to um, are consistently um, being raised by those of us who are um, from Ward 7. Um, we think that programming um, is essential and um, you, you can't start in a particular type of program, have no middle school option and go somewhere else and then come back. So we're 
we're, we're definitely um, continue to raise that. But I hope that people will take the time to get up to speed with the um, um, committee and the meetings and to listen to some of the discussions. Um, okay, we're at time. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for um, sharing all the myriad of things that are happening um, out of your office. There's a lot to be tuned into and to be aware of. We need everyone um, actively involved and engaged. And so thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you um, coming this evening and everyone else. When we put this up on our YouTube site and we put it out there, tell everyone they need to listen. There's a lot they need to be aware of that's going on in terms of education structurally in um, this year. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Marlon. Thanks on behalf of my whole team that came tonight. We love these discussions. We're available to you. Um, in our document, we included the links that you asked for in terms of the advisory committee meetings, as well as lots of other chances to register uh, and get engaged. So we appreciate you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So we're not quite done yet. Um, so that was the um, Deputy Mayor Kine and his team. Um, I want to now bring um, our State Board um, Rep from Ward 7 and the President of the State Board of Education for to provide um, updates. Good evening. Um, I sound a little crazy because I'm sick. Uh, so I have not uh, been at schools. I um, have stayed home. I sent in my sick note. I did not go to any back to school nights, uh, but I'm happy to be able uh, to join uh, you all virtually. If we have not met, uh, my name is Ebony Rose Thompson, uh, and I do serve as the Ward 7 representative uh, on the State Board of Education. Um, a couple things that are just like today things. Um, please let me know if you have schools who are having um, HVAC issues in particular, because it was 100 degrees today. Uh, I know um, I've been in contact uh, with DGS and DCPS about uh, NAL and Plummer um, in particular, if there are other schools um, that you know of or I need to look out for, even though I cannot go show up because I'm trying to keep my cooties to myself, uh, feel free to email or text me uh, and I will add them uh, to the list of schools uh, to look out for uh, promptly. I understand we should have um, window coolers at NAW, uh, at like the, you know, the window units at NAW as of this evening. So um, please, please, please let me know um, so our classrooms aren't hot. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, second, we had our working session last night. Uh, two uh, things that will be coming uh, before the board pretty quickly um, and could benefit from engagement. Thing number one, um, I know uh, many of you who are on the phone or on the line, uh, we're, do, we're, we're doing engagement with us as we talked about the ESSA amendment. And I kept saying, like, the design is important, but we haven't quite got to design. This is all about the formula. We are now at the time where it's time to talk about the design of what the report card looks like. The report card for uh, the end of this year is still based on last year's design. Um, but the report card for 2024 uh, and, and anything beyond that uh, is what we will have some engagement around designing. Um, OSI does have a survey out. Um, I think they have sent it to us. They should have sent it to us. I'll double check. If I can pull it, I will put it in the chat. Uh, if not, um, I'll make sure uh, to share it uh, with the Ed Council um, and send it and put it on social media channels if I don't have it yet. Um, so that's the first thing is report cards. Uh, the second thing, uh, financial literacy. I know this is something that Ward 7 um, residents in particular were very interested in. And um, there were a couple council members uh, who were um, entertaining legislation. It just so happens uh, that you don't have to legislate uh, financial literacy standards. That's something we can do uh, as state board. Uh, and we're working with OSSI on that. Um, so uh, if you are interested in engaging around what financial literacy standards look like for the district, um, feel free to let me know. Also, feel free to show up uh, to our meetings um, and testify, or you can write, um, you can send written testimony. Um, our meetings are always the third Wednesday of the month. We did not have a public meeting in August. Um, we will be back. Uh, I guess that is 
September 20th is our next public meeting. We meet at the old council chambers, uh, 5.30 p.m. Um, that is an in-person meeting. We are working uh, to have hybrid capabilities once again, um, but until we have those capabilities, uh, which I am working on also with DGS, uh, we will be in person. So please pay attention uh, to those two things um, coming up. Uh, last thing people should know about um, that was not covered in the deputy mayor's presentation uh, is school safety. Um, there is a school safety task force uh, that is being assembled. Um, I do get to make one appointment as the board president um, of one of my members, um, and there will be other appointments. I expect there at least be at least one other um, one person or parent uh, from Ward 7. I can't make that appointment, but uh, word on the street is there will be some Ward 7 res representation on that task force around school safety. Um, I look forward um, to continuing to uh, engage in that conversation um, because without safety, a lot of the other things we talk about really don't work, really don't matter. Um, so just letting you all know um, that that's coming down the pike. Um, if uh, you do not, I did send out a newsletter I think last week, my days are running together and I'm on cold medicine. So I could be a little confused, uh, but um, I sent out a newsletter. I do my best to send out one once a month. Um, this meeting was in there. If there are things that are happening in our community that you're like people should know about, especially if there are good things happening like in schools or related to kids, uh, please send them my way. Um, I do my best to uh, try to kind of like shine a light on the positive things. Um, and also, you know, we'll follow up on all the negative things, but uh, please let me know uh, if you want to receive the newsletter or if you have things that should be in the newsletter. Um, that's my report. I'm happy um, to be with you all this evening, and I will make sure to put my contact information in the chat. Thank you. And it was not planned that we both have on yellow. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so with that being said, I just really want to talk about, um, we continue this new gear. We need, um, committees upstanding. We need chairs. I want to introduce, um, the new, um, vice president or vice chair. I think that's what it's called, um, for the word seven, um, um, uh, Marina, hi, um, I'll pin her in a minute. Um, but. Also, we um, ha are in the process of um, um, solidifying some funds so that we can do a really big um, recruitment effort this year. We want representation from every school in Ward 7. Um, we want definitely um, um, from every LSAT, every PTA. Um, we want uh, parents and st um, staff from school. So we are really, really pushing. The next two months will uh, feature um, our schools will be here to talk about their schools so that people can learn more about um, Ward 7 schools. Um, that's going to be a portion of the meeting over the next few months also. So um, again, there is a lot going on. We want people well informed. Um, and we want people to be engaged in on one of those committees, if on one of our committees. If you're interested in a committee, and I know you all are, um, then email me so that we can get you um, um, ready to go and ready to work for Ward 7 students. Um, with that being said, like I said, we'll be inviting um, schools over the next few months Next month, we'll really be looking at DCPS high schools and middle schools um, and inviting them. We've already had a number of commitments from some schools, and we will continue to um, um, get commitments from as many schools as possible. You may look at some of these schools and say, well, um, they're not located in Ward 7. Yeah, that's partly true. But our children who live in Ward 7 um, are actually fed into some of these schools or they have significantly large um, Ward 7 populations or they're new to Ward 7 through um, the ANC redistricting process and the ward changing process that happened, um, um, was that last year or the year before? Time is running um, together. 
So just wanted to let you know about some upcoming things. Um, if there are some announcements that anybody would like to make, um, please do so now. Can I make an announcement that I forgot? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to put in the chat, um, it, it was in my newsletter. Um, I don't have the quick, the cute bit.ly version, but the link, the long link will work. Um, I have, there is a, I'm doing a board seven survey on education things. Um, given all the things that are happening, like with report card, um, the master facilities plan we heard about tonight, the boundary study, some of those kind of have common themes about like what you want to see in your schools, um, what programming should look like, um, like what you care about the most. So uh, if you have a couple minutes during this meeting, um, please click on the survey and share. Or if you receive the newsletter, forward it to someone and ask them to take it. Um, because it is helpful when we show up to the meetings. It's also helpful uh, when we can say X amount of residents have said this um, and kind of be proactive um, in saying like what we want uh, instead of what we are asked to respond to at any given moment. So um, I put the link to the Google form in the chat. Um, I also share the prettier link um, over social media again. So thank you all. Thank you. Um... Sharona, you want to come and uh, make an announcement? Sharona is um, the representative from DCPS um, for community engagement. She's no stranger to anyone um, in the city, but definitely not us in um, east of the river. So, um, Sharona? Good evening, everyone. And hello, Ward 7. Um, I, too, am a Ward 7 resident. Um, my name is Sharona Robinson. I'm the manager of community affairs and engagement in our office of engagement and partnerships. Just wanted to quickly share um, two things. One, welcome back to school. Um, this is our second week back. We've uh, been really excited to welcome students back. And I wanted to share um, a quick link for uh, students to manage their mental health as they navigate this new school year. And then um, two, I wanted to invite uh, families to our DCPS back to school block party. It will be hosted at McKinley High School on September 23rd from 11 to two. Um, and you can register at Eventbrite. I will drop the link in the chat. And as always, I really enjoy um, these meetings. Thank you, Marla. Thank you, thank you. I want to make sure that everyone knows about our Word 7 um, Education Council YouTube channel where we upload all our meetings. So if you miss one or you want to go back to one or you want to share it, this is the place you can find it. Please make sure that you are aware of that. And um, we will be having um, elections. So more to come on that. With that, I really want to also, I don't think that Marina is on camera. But um, Marina, there she is. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you want to say anything? Uh -huh. Wait a minute. I'm trying to pin you. Um, hold on. I don't. Okay. Okay. You got me. Um, do I have you as a pin? Yeah, I guess you do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, go ahead if you have anything you would like to say. Sure, I'll just do a quick introduction. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marina. Hi, I am the newly elected vice chair for the War 7 Education Council. Um, I am also a DCPS parent. Um, my daughter attends Randall Highlands Elementary School where she started third grade this year. Um, and I'm also PTO president as well. So I'm really looking forward to uh, working with you guys this year. I'm excited for the opportunity um, and look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you and we're excited to have you. And so with that, Unless there's anything anyone wants to say, we are at time, 7.59, 30 seconds to spare. We're going to adjourn. See you on the first Thursday of every month. And i um, really excited to be in space with you and to work with you this year as we support the children and family and schools and staff and everyone that makes it happen um and we're at seven for our children thank you have a good evening you too good night good, good night, night.